Black Solstice. I'm dreaming of a black solstice, Bling Crowley. Tell us again, Daddy. Oh no, it's far too late for that. Please? Well, okay. John Reed was sitting on an uncomfortably small chair at the foot of his daughter's bunk bed. It was late, it was cold outside, and he had an important meeting in the morning. He stroked his powerful hand through his beard and glanced automatically at his wristwatch, which was illuminated by a My Little Pony lava lamp. Tupac, the family cat, was nestled in the lower bunk, curled around Jesse's feet like a black spot in the pages of a Bible. He sighed. What story do you want to hear? He asked, though he already knew the answer. There was only one story that the two of them could possibly want to hear at this time of year, and he was the only one who'd tell it. His wife, Mildred, believed the old superstitions and said it was bad luck. Daddy, Daddy, little Jesse said, her eyes staring out from the darkness like two bright beacons of hope and innocence. Tell us the story of Satan Claus. Satan Claus, he replied, raising an eyebrow. Aren't you a bit old for that? No, Daddy, no, Jude said. Go on, tell us the story. Okay, John said, shrugging his shoulders and shifting uncomfortably in the chair. Well, the story goes like this. Back in the olden days, a long, long time ago, before you were born. Yes, John chuckled softly, feeling his age along with an ache in his back from where the cold weather and the storm front had taken its toll. Long, long before I was born. So what happened? I'm getting there, John replied. It goes back to the Bible. Adam's first wife, Lilith, flew into a tremendous rage after God created Eve, and God punished her for her jealousy by making her mortal. But then, as she wandered the earth alone and in the depths of her despair, Satan went to her in the form of a goat and asked her to drink his blood. And did she? Yes, John said. The unholy blood was too much for her and it killed her. But though her body died, her spirit lived on, and she was doomed to spend the rest of eternity at his side, feasting on the blood of children, just like you two. The two girls shuddered in their beds, and John Reed felt the beginnings of a smile in spite of himself. Scaring children during solstice season was a tradition as old as time itself, and if the legends were true, it served a purpose. Lilith is the mother of them all, John continued, the she-devil, Mrs. Claus. They say she still sleeps beside him in their double coffin, hiding from the deadly sunlight as they wait for the winter solstice, the longest night. When they can, they add others to their cause, corrupting their victims with a bite and creating creatures of the night. Your granddad? Grandad Woodinge? No, Jesse, John replied. Grandad Bygrave. He used to be what they called a staker. It was his job to search the cemetery for little air holes or disturbances amongst the graves at St. Editha's. When he found something, he had to dig up the grave and put a stake through the heart of the poor unfortunate that was buried beneath the soil. Ew. That's nothing, John said. In some other places, very far away from here, they decapitate their dead to make sure that they don't come back. What does decapitate mean? Never you mind, John said. In Italy, the doctors wash their hands with communion wine. When their patients die, they break people's legs and bury them upside down. That's gross, Daddy, Jude scolded, pouting at him as she put her little hands over her ears. Well, it's a small price to pay, John said. It's better for you to know these things. The vampires are dangerous with superhuman strength and speed. They're also immortal. What does that mean, Daddy? It means they don't die, John replied grimly. He thought once again about whether he was telling them too much, but then he reminded himself that, like the birds and the bees, it was just one of the facts of life that they needed to know. According to the legends, John continued, if someone died and their body was left unguarded, they'd turn into a creature of the night. Your other granddad, Granddad Woodins, used to work as a watcher. A watcher? Yes, Jude, John said. He'd stand guard over the dead with a lit candle, watching day and night until it was time to bury them. He used to hold a loaded shotgun and keep watch for animals. Like rabbits? Uh-huh, John replied. And cats and dogs, too. The old timers say that if an animal jumps over a body before it's buried, it will turn into a vampire by the following night. They say a lot, Jude said. John paused for a second and smiled in the darkness, struck again by just how smart his kids were. They were little prodigies, clever clogs who'd been raised on classical music since their time in the womb, even though he knew the Mozart effect was a steaming pile of bull****. But they played Mozart to the girls anyway, just in case the scientists were wrong. Is it true that only bad people become vampires, Daddy? No, Jesse, John said. They used to say that only those who'd led evil lives or who'd refused religion could become vampires. They suspected witches of being vampires too, but we know better, don't we, girls? Yeah, huh? Jude said, sticking a thumb in her mouth and looking out at her dad from the top bunk. Grandma Woodinge is a witch, and she keeps us safe from Satan Claus. Exactly, girls, John said. So there's nothing to worry about, is there? Nuh-uh. Good, 
John said, yawning slightly and stretching out his arms. Now, I think that's enough for one night, isn't it? Besides, we can't let your mother know we've been talking about Satan Claus again, or she'll have my guts for garters. What does that mean, Daddy? Never you mind, John repeated, his moustache twitching as he suppressed a laugh. Now, go on, you two. It's time for you to go to sleep. Sweet dreams. Simply having a terrible solstice time. Paul McStake in the Hartney. On Solstice Eve, the two Reed girls were running around in the garden and playing in the snow when they saw a magpie in the trees. It was soon joined by another, and then another. The birds lined up like black-gowned judges waiting to pass sentence on the children. Jude nodded at her sister, and the two turned and saluted to the birds. Then they started to sing together in a cherubic harmony, their time in the church choir shining through as they worked their way through the rhyme. One for sorrow, they chorus, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy, five for silver, six for gold, seven for a secret never to be told, eight for a wish, nine for a kiss, ten a surprise you should be careful not to miss, eleven for health, twelve for wealth, thirteen beware, it's the devil himself. Magpies are always bad luck, Jesse grumbled. Like breaking a mirror, Jude replied. Exactly. There was a sharp gust of wind and the magpies took off, their departure leaving a heavy silence that settled over the garden like a fog. Both of the girls were wrapped up warm, but they shivered in tandem as the sun sauntered behind a cloud and cast the garden into shadow. They looked to the snowman they'd built for comfort, but there was no warmth to the coal that he had for eyes, and the twigs they'd used for his arms looked brittle and uninviting. Let's go inside, Jesse said. The inside of the house looked like an explosion at a jumble sale, with all sorts of weird and wonderful items scattered throughout it. The decorations were mostly in red, green and gold, symbolising the blood of Christ, the eternal life of the evergreen tree and the gifts of the three magi. The initials VM for Virgin Mary had been carved repeatedly into the wooden door and window frames. The banister, which crawled lazily down a steep and narrow Edwardian staircase, was carved with obscene phalli, stiff and floppy dicks saluting the girls every time they ran upstairs. Mildred didn't like them and had begged her husband to get rid of them, but he'd always overruled her because of the older potropaic superstitions. That's why he'd also agreed to bury an old boot outside the back door. What's the difference between an amulet and a talisman? Jude asked as the girls raced up the stairs towards their playroom. One's got an N in it? Well, that too, Jude replied. But that wasn't what I meant, silly. So what's the difference? A talisman brings good luck, Jude said, and an amulet wards off evil. So which one do we need? Jesse asked. Jude shook her head grimly and said, both. "'Twas the night before solstice, when all through the shack "'not a creature was stirring, not even a bat. "'Clement Van Helsing. "'The house smelled like garlic. "'A silver chalice sat on a silver tray on a table in the kitchen. "'It was filled with a clear liquid, holy water from the healing springs of Lords, "'and two communion wafers sat on a silver plate beside them. "'A wooden crucifix lay between the two of them. "'It was midnight on the morning of December 21st. The house was one of several dozen that were nestled beneath a blanket of snow over Grey Friars Close and the rest of Mile End. Upstairs, in their bedrooms, the Reed family slumbered on. John Reed was fast asleep, his moustache net holding his precious curls out of his nose and mouth. Mildred, his wife, was asleep beside him, though she was twitching. In the other bedroom, the twins were still awake, and they were terrified. Jesse and Jude were seven years old, and they were just about old enough to still believe in Satan Claus. Some of the children at school had said that Satan was made up by capitalists to sell more products, but Jesse and Jude kept themselves to themselves and didn't give a hoot what the other kids said. Perhaps Satan Claus was just their father in a silly suit, but then again, perhaps not. And they didn't want to take the risk and then find out that they were wrong. John Reed had told them that they were taking Pascal up on his wager. They hadn't known what he'd meant at the time, but then they'd asked Mr Griffin at the school and he told them all about it. It made a lot of sense after that. Perhaps Satan Claus didn't exist, but then again, perhaps he did. If they took the right precautions and he did exist, they had a shot at surviving. If he didn't, well, they'd just look a little silly. And Jesse and Jude didn't care if they looked silly, as long as they survived. And so they'd stayed up late on Solstice Eve, roaming around the house and performing the final touches, scattering salt circles around their beds and polishing all of the mirrors. A couple of weeks earlier, they'd found some sticks while they were walking by the river, and they spent the days between sharpening the sticks with their daddy's penknife. Luckily for them, he hadn't caught them. They'd hung a silver horseshoe above their bedroom door, polished every shiny surface until they could see their faces and placed mirrors by the doors and windows. In the back garden, tear-shaped nazars hung from trees, channeling the old magic to protect the house from the glare of the evil eye. The house was festooned with images of Christ and they'd woven St Bridget's crosses out of rush to hang in each of the rooms. In their bedroom, a homemade dream catcher made of yarn hung above their bunk bed, occasionally bopping Jude on the head if she sat up in the night. 
Blown glass witch balls hung in every room, and so did bunches of wildflowers, including branches of ash, oak, wild rose, white heather and hawthorn. Jessie had even asked her daddy to bring her some clippings from the aspen tree at the bottom of the garden. Does it have to be aspen? he'd asked. Of course, she'd replied matter-of-factly. That's the same kind of tree they used to make Jesus' cross, daddy. They'd scattered mustard seeds on the floors and even convinced their parents to leave the taps on, thanks to the old story that vampires couldn't cross running water. They'd also asked their mother if they could hang some mistletoe, but she'd refused. Mistletoe is a patriarchal tradition designed to apply social pressure to young women until they agree to kiss old men, she'd insisted. I mean, the juice in the berries represents shit for goodness sake. What sh**, mummy? Never you mind. But the girls were hopeful that they'd be able to wear her down eventually, just like they'd done with the gun and the silver bullets. The two girls had been making zero headway until they presented their mother with a series of charts and graphs that showed the prevalence of home invasions. She'd relented after that, and she'd been their key weapon when it came to convincing their father. John Reed would have done anything for his daughters, and so he'd purchased an illegal firearm from a guy called Silky at the local boozer. He kept the gun and the holy bullets inside a shoebox in the drawer of his bedside table. That afternoon, Mildred cut her hand while helping her daughters to bake communion wafers. She tried to hide it from them, to cover the wound with a plaster before they noticed. But the twins' eyes were as sharp as their intellects, and before she'd even removed the first aid kit from the kitchen cupboards, they'd told her what she needed to do. You did an oopsie, Mummy, Jude said. You know the rules. And she did know the rules, too. It was said that any wound left untreated with boiling water was enough to let the evil in, and so the traditionalists poured boiling water over graves during funerals. In the Reed household, it meant that she had to pop the kettle on and take a couple of aspirin. That night, she was sleeping with a bandage around her hand. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. Satan Claus is coming to town. John Reed woke up with a start as something primal took over him. He was a fully grown adult with 31 winters behind him, but there was something about the old traditions that still held sway over him. He could remember a time in his own childhood when John Sr. had taken the boy on his knee and given him the talk. Son, he'd said, I think you're old enough now to know what's what. We maintain the old traditions because there's often a grain of truth to them. They say it's better to be safe than sorry, you see. Now, the winter is a dark and unpleasant time, a time that's full of dangers and where the elements themselves turn against us. Might be that there is a Satan clause and that the legends are true. Might be that there isn't. But if what they say is true and he's the Antichrist, the Prince of Darkness, well, maybe it's better to take the superstition seriously just in case, eh? That was the solstice when John Reed had stayed up all night, his eyes darting frantically from shadow to shadow, convinced that Satan Claus would sweep in at any moment and rip him apart. Once the sun had finally crept over the horizon, he'd passed out and caught an hour or two of sleep before being woken back up for the celebrations. He'd spent most of solstice day dozing off over the dinner table and waking back every time his chin dipped into the gravy. Satan Claus hadn't come to visit that year, and nor had he come the year after. In fact, Satan Claus never came for John Reed, but the name alone was still enough to send shivers down his spine. He heard a creak on the landing, but the house was old and had a habit of singing to itself. He extricated himself from his wife's arms and rolled over onto his side, then folded his pillow in half and rested his head on the cool fabric. His ears twitched as he listened to the darkness, but there was nothing but a sleepy silence, a treacle-like emptiness that filled his ears like a spoonful of honey. Then he closed his eyes again and tried to catch some sleep. Does he ride a red-nosed hellhound? Are there weapons on his sleigh? Slade. The two girls were still awake and still terrified. Jessie was the older of the two by an hour, and so she was the de facto leader of the Reed twins. She was the first out of bed, and she used the glow of the nightlight to climb down from a bunk and onto the hardwood floor. The snow outside was still falling, piling up against the concrete walls and chilling the house beneath a wintry blanket. It had seeped through into the floor, and it chilled her feet as she navigated across to the dresser and picked up the rosaries, which lay incongruously amongst a pile of stuffed toys and collectibles. She placed one around her neck and one around her sister's. They worked in silence, their ears tensed as they listened out for sounds from elsewhere in the house. Next, the two girls scattered seeds and rice across the floor, upending jars and wrenching open plastic packaging until the wood was covered with kernels and grains. Anne Welsh from their mass class had told them that vampires were obsessed with numbers, and that once he saw the scattered seeds, Satan Claus would have to stop and count them. If they kept him busy for long enough, the sun would rise and he'd be killed by the light. They didn't know whether they believed that, but they'd done it anyway. Susie Reed, no relation, from the year below, had told them that Satan Claus had a legion of minions made up of some of the vilest people from history. Vlad the Impaler was the obvious one, the fierce Wallachian who'd earned his nickname by impaling his enemies on wooden stakes and leaving them there to die. According to Susie, Vlad used to eat bread that had been dipped in his victim's blood while he watched them die. 
Then there was Mike Austin, Lucy Austin's older brother. He told his sister, who told the rest of her class, about Countess Elizabeth Bathory, a Hungarian heiress with the blood of dozens of enemies on her hands, as well as her lips and tongue. According to the Austins, Bathory had them brought to her so she could bite them. After they died, she'd have her servants drain their blood before pouring it into a bathtub. Mike Austin said that was because bath bombs hadn't been invented yet. Stavros said they were called Virkolikas, but Besnik called them Striga and Ansa said they were Strigoi. Mr. Ricard, the substitute teacher who was presiding over the class at the time, said it was all just a matter of semantics. Do you know how to stop a Strigoi? Mr. Ricard had asked. He'd looked out at the sea of interested little faces and sighed. When no one answered, he'd continued. They used to bury corpses upside down and put scythes and sickles in the grave. It was said that if the body bloated before becoming a fully-fledged vampire, the sickle would prick them and put them back down again. As for Vikolakas, the best option is to leave a coin in their mouths so that they can pay the ferryman at the River Styx. If they can't cross the river, they come back to feast on flesh. Then he'd remembered he was supposed to be teaching geography and had moved on to talking about continental drift. But all that had been during a happier time, during the summer months when the coming of the vampire was a distant shadow of the future and not an immediate threat to their survival. That had been then, and this was now, on Solstice Eve, the hunting night of the vampires. The two reed girls were as ready as they'd ever be. They just didn't know if they were ready enough. They closed their eyes and bowed their heads, and then Jude led them in a prayer. Dear baby Jesus, Jude intoned solemnly, please keep us safe from Satan claws, or better still, send us a sign that he doesn't exist. But no such sign was forthcoming. I'm keeping my distance, I've got my gun drawn. If he comes any closer, I won't shoot to warn. John Lemon and Yoko Oh No, the vampire is coming. But Satan claws did exist, and he was having a bad day. His flying hellhounds had got lost over Marseille, and it had taken Adolf's red nose to sniff out the English Channel. It had been raining in Transylvania, but the rain had turned to snow as they flew west in his sleigh. He drew back his fiery whip, a solstice gift from his friend the Balrog, and swung it through the air. It broke the sound barrier with a sonic boom that echoed out over the English countryside. Now slasher, he cried. Now stabber, now brawler and basher. On killer, on screamer, on pouncer and crasher. And his hellhounds flew on into the darkness. You scumbag, you friar, no match for vampires. The Rogues featuring Kirsty McBarlow. Just as John Reed was about to doze off for good, he heard a noise from above that sent a chill of fear through his soul. It was the sound of sleigh bells, the horrible funereal gongs that echoed through the sky like a thunderclap. He sat bolt upright in his bed, then shook Mildred into life and put a finger to his lips. Sapnin, she murmured, still drunk on sleep. Are you awake? John asked. What do you think? Yeah, John whispered. I couldn't sleep either. Did you hear something? Like what? I thought I heard something on the reef, John said. I thought it might be, I don't know. The vampire, Mildred asked. She'd woken up a little and had pulled herself up so that she was sitting upright too. John reached over to the bedside lamp and clicked it into life. John, aren't you too old for children's stories? There's no such thing as vampires, husband. There are just people who believe in vampires and sometimes that's just as bad. Ah, those guys, John replied. The ones who get professional fang fittings and who carry out rituals and sh those guys are idiots, but just because a few fools like to play fancy dress, it doesn't mean that the real things aren't out there. But vampires, John, Mildred argued. You're talking about bad guys from the depth of the night, created in the twilight hours before God rested. Lilith, the demon wife of Adam and her dark lord husband, drinking the blood of children. You can't believe everything you read in the Bible. I read it on Wikipedia, her husband said. Did you know that you can find a vampire's grave by leading a virgin boy through a graveyard on the back of a black stallion? Sounds fishy to me, considering vampires can't walk on consecrated ground. They used to bury corpses with lemons in their mouths to stop them from coming back. Do you know what I read on Wikipedia? Mildred asked. In 2006, a physics professor wrote a paper proving that it's mathematically impossible for vampires to exist, thanks to geometric progression. If the first vampire had appeared in January 1600 and fed once per month, turning each of its victims into a vampire, the entire world would have been vampires within two and a half years. That's not the point. Then what is the point? I think Satan Claus is here, John replied, and I think he might be coming down the chimney. Come on, Millie, John insisted. We might as well go and take a look just to be sure. Fine. Should I take the gun? No, Mildred replied. If you do, you'll end up shooting someone. Yes, John said absently. That's kind of the point. Last solstice I gave you my neck, but the very next day you went back to heck. This year, to save me from fear, I'm going to hide in heaven. Splat. Satan Claus was coming down the chimney. 
The front door would have been easier, but that was protected by old magic, a power greater even than he was. He was the Antichrist, the first vampire, and vampires had to be invited over the threshold. He was thirsty, so thirsty, and it was time for his annual feast. Blood was the thing, the delicious nectar of life that sustained him. The blood of virgins was better. The blood of the young was best, for they were free and innocent. They hadn't yet been touched by evil. He worked at night by the light of the moon, chasing it across the sky and returning to his crypt before the first rays of the morning sun filtered over the horizon. The sunlight, along with the warmth that it brought, was deadly. That was why he worked at night. Solstice Eve and Solstice Morning, until the dawn at least, was the one night of year that he worked. Every year, his evil elves delivered a list of who'd been naughty and who'd been nice. He'd worked through the list, taking care not to touch the paper against his flaming beard in case it caught light. Then he'd shortlist a dozen names from the top of the good list and carry out basic reconnaissance on the run-up to Solstice. It was the good little boys and girls who tasted the best. The bad boys and girls tasted like rotten apples and gave him the bloody equivalent of a hangover. And that was how he'd settled on Jesse and Jude Reed. He'd been watching the girls for several months, documenting every decision they made on his diabolical notebook. He tracked their searches on their smart speakers and digitally snooped on them as they ploughed their crops in Farmville or popped bubbles in Candy Crush Saga. He knew more about them than anyone, including their parents. He'd been preparing for this moment for some time, and now he was finally ready. He hit the fire at the bottom of the chimney feet first, but the flames simply fed his desire and regenerated him, leaving him stronger and more determined than ever. He could smell the two girls, and they were ready for him. Satan Claus smiled grimly and climbed out of the fireplace, unfolding himself to his full height in the middle of the reed's suburban living room. He was bloated, his stomach distended like a starving child in a charity campaign. Lesser vampires resorted to draining the blood from cattle and sheep, but Satan Claus was a purist. Only the freshest human blood could pass his palate, and he was thirsty. He walked out of the living room and out into the hallway, his footsteps falling silently with soft thup thup thups that didn't make an echo. The hallway was dark, but that wasn't a problem for Satan Claus, who could hunt by smell just as easily as by sight. The floorboards creaked as he placed his weight on them, but the sound was swallowed up by the darkness. From above him he could discern the subtle thumping of four heartbeats, two in each of the upstairs bedrooms. He drew his tongue across his lips, sending filthy dead blood dribbling down his chin. He gnashed subconsciously at the air, just like his thralls when they chewed through their shrouds in their graves. The house was an unwelcoming place, packed to the rafters with the symbols of white magic. But Satan Claus was a hunter, and like all hunters, he reveled in the thrill of the chase. It would make his meal all the better. I'll have a black solstice without you. Elvis Deathly. The door to their bedroom seemed to open of its own accord. Then the darkness changed texture and a figure stepped silently through the doorway. Satan Claus was dressed in robes of black, though they were trimmed with crimson. To the two girls who were still learning their relative scale, he looked ten feet tall. But that was impossible because it would have pushed his head through the ceiling and up towards the roof, where his sleigh was still perched precariously, his hellhounds scrabbling their claws across the tiles and sending them, crashing them down to the floor. Oh, 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 Satan Claus growled, his voice sounding like the rattle of a corpse as it swung in the breeze at a medieval crossroads. Merry solstice. He held his dark hand up and tensed it into a fist, sending a ripple of evil washing over the room like the fog from a smoke machine. The candles in the window, which symbolised that Christ was the light of the world, were extinguished by a wave of black wind. The vampire's psychokinetic energy erupted outwards like a sonic boom, except it was visible as it passed through the darkness. A fierce wind blew through the building, detonating the girl's nativity scene and sending the baby Jesus flying through the air and into the wall, where he shattered. The China models had been valuable family heirlooms, passed down from generation to generation, but within the space of a couple of seconds, they'd been turned into nothing more than a pile of brightly painted broken pottery. Outside, in the garden, the snowman's head exploded, its cold eyes firing through the night and into the windows of the girl's bedroom, sending shards of glass scattering across their stuffed toys and all over the floor. And in the bedroom, the two girls looked imperiously out from their bunks. The vampire had protruding teeth and an aquiline nose, as well as the hungry look of a man who hadn't eaten for a year. As he looked at the girls, his gaze alone was enough to freeze them to their beds, as though they were trapped between wakefulness and unconsciousness in a satanic sleep paralysis. He took a step towards the girls and then another. Get away from my kids, you make-believe The vampire's head turned in a full semicircle, taking in Mildred Reed in her nightdress and her husband a step and a half behind her. She had a wooden stake in one hand and a hammer in the other, and she was rushing towards him like a woman possessed. The sharpened wood was closing in on him, but the vampire was too fast for it, clicking his fingers and dissolving into a whirling cloud of bats, which dodged the woman's jabs and batted against her, their little legs getting tangled up in her hair. 
John swatted ineffectively at them, while Mildred continued to swing the stake through the air at a target that no longer existed. In their beds, the girls came back to life again, their innocent bodies no longer pinned in place by the vampire's evil eye. They moved towards their stockings. There was a growl from the darkness in the hallway, and then Tupac was in the room too, a black cat battling black bats, but the bats were fighting back and the cat was howling. Its unnatural yowl seemed to break the spell, and the room flooded with volume as everyone tried to move at once. Satan claws reformed, the bats disappearing beneath his robes, while John and Mildred made a rush for him. The girls were at the feet of their beds, rummaging through their stockings for the gifts within. Jude was the quickest, and she tore the wrapping from what looked like a bottle of perfume before raising it in both arms. Satan Claus took the hit of holy water straight in the face. Well, tonight, thank God it's them instead of you. Band-Aids over puncture holes. Oh, 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 Satan Claus growled. Is that the best you can do? Time stood still around him. Jude was still holding the bottle in front of her face, visible mostly as a pair of bright green eyes in the darkness. Jessie was in the bunk below, her hands still buried deep within her stocking. Satan Claus was in the middle of the room with his back to the door, while Tupac had bolted for the floor beneath the bed and was watching proceedings unfold with the disinterested wariness of the common house cat. John and Mildred were to either side of the vampire, their hammers raised in the air as they fumbled with their stakes, and Lilith was standing in the doorway. She was like Satan Claus but with style, a biblical beauty who'd added flavour over time like a fine wine. Her husband was unkempt for a vampire, with flowing white hair, a bushy beard and a big belly. Lilith looked like she took care of herself, like she worked out every night lifting the lids off crypts or doing gothic lunges. She was dressed mostly in velvet with a few hints of leather, and her lips and fingernails were painted the deep scarlet of an aged bottle of O negative. Enough of this, husband, Lilith said, clapping her hands together. When her palms touched, the two adults were thrown against opposite walls of the bedroom, where they smacked against the walls and then slid to the floor in a broken symmetry. Let's feed. Like hell, John growled, pushing himself up on one knee before slumping back down again. Blood was flowing freely from somewhere on his scalp, and his wife was unconscious but breathing. My good man, Satan Claus said, I have no desire to hurt you or your wife. I remember you as a child. You used to write me letters every solstice, begging me not to take you or your brothers. His mouth fell open. All we want is to feed, Lilith said, her voice floating eerily on the supernatural wind that was still blowing through the house, setting ornaments tumbling to the floor and rotating crucifixes where they hung above the doorways. But they're my daughters. So, Satan Claus replied, leering evilly at him, you planned a solstice dinner tomorrow, did you not? John Reed said nothing. Yes, husband, Lilith added, they have a turkey defrosting in the refrigerator. But that's different, John protested. Is it? Satan Claus growled. It died so you could live. How is this any different? It just... Mr. Reed, I grow tired of talking to you, Satan Claus said. Don't make me kill you. After all, alive you can make new children. Dead, you're no good to anyone. You... I'll... It's okay, Daddy, Jude said, her voice sounding eerily calm amidst the chaos. I know what we have to do. Yes, Jessie agreed. It's the only way. Girls, I don't... Yes, Lilith said. It's as it should be. She clicked her fingers and the girl's leather-bound Bible flew off their bookcase and towards their father's head. It knocked him clean out and he snoozed on in silence like his wife while the vampires moved in on the two girls. They offered no resistance. I'll be eligible for parole come Valentine's Day. Tom waits for no man. Solstice card from a vampire in Minneapolis. John Reed awoke to a bloodbath of sorts, though his pale-faced angelic daughters had been drained of the stuff. They were both still in their bunks, their glassy eyes staring up at the ceiling, the puncture marks in their necks looking like recharge sockets for androids. Their skin had turned a papery white, matching their pristine bedsheets and giving them the look of department store mannequins wearing old-fashioned wedding dresses. Tupac, the cat, was dead too. His head had been torn off and thrown at the girl's stuffed animals like a bowling ball. The rest of the cat was poking out of their Jesus-themed litter bin, making a mockery of the Saviour's own suffering. Christ who was hanging from a cross on its facade, had blood on his forehead and was looking out at the scene with an expression of beatific resignation. Mildred was unconscious still, though she was coming round. She had a bloody nose that had dripped down onto her chest, and John supposed she was lucky not to have landed differently or she might have drowned in the stuff. He himself had bled heavily from the wound to the back of his skull, and he had a splitting headache that reminded him of his hangover days before he'd given up the bottle after the kids were born. Mildred, John said. Millie, are you okay? Mmm... He killed them, John murmured. Mm. The girls, John said, he killed them. Drained them of blood, they're gone, Millie. They were? They're gone, John repeated, pulling himself unsteadily to his feet. He looked around the room again. 
there was blood on all four walls and the ceiling, presumably from the cat, and the girl's normally tidy bedroom looked like the aftermath of a bomb blast in Beirut. Even their dream catches had been torn down, and on the far wall of the room, their portrait of Christ stood watch beneath his crown of thorns. Someone had drawn a goatee, horns and glasses on him in the cat's blood. John picked up one of the stakes in his hammer. No, Mildred said, not that, John, anything but that. We have to. I can't. Then I'll do it. Mildred tried to pull herself to her feet, but all her strength had been taken away and she stumbled and fell again. John flashed a quick glance of concern at her, but then he returned to the task in hand. He dealt with Jessie first, because she was on the bottom bunk and she was easier for him to reach. When he placed the stake above her heart and smacked it with a hammer, the wood pierced her flesh and an unearthly hiss filled the air. She crumbled before his eyes, turning to dust and bone. Jude came next, with the same result. Once the job was done, John Reed glanced resignedly at his wife and then walked silently out of the room. He returned several minutes later with a shoebox in his hands. What are you doing? Mildred asked, as he removed the gun from the box and started loading bullets into the chamber. What do you think I'm doing? It's too late, Mildred said. They're gone. Your silver bullets are useless, just like the rest of these trinkets. It's not for the vampires, John said sadly, as he loaded the cartridges into the revolver. It's for us. For us? It's our fault that the girls are dead, John said. We didn't believe. We couldn't believe. But we were wrong, Millie. I was wrong. If we'd just believed, if we'd just been a little faster, we could have fought them off. The girls might still be alive, but now there's nothing, nothing to live for. Mildred seemed to think about it for a moment. Then she said, OK, but as long as you shoot me first. You'd better watch out. You'd better not cry. Satan Claus is coming to town. The family was found in the morning when the three Jenkins kids from number 17 stopped by to sing some solstice carols. When they went to knock at the door, it was already hanging open, and so they'd let themselves inside for a break from the cold. They'd found John and Mildred in the smaller of the two upstairs bedrooms. They were lying slumped, arm in arm, with their backs against the wall, their glassy eyes staring vacantly towards their daughter's bunk bed. They weren't moving, but that was no surprise. Most of their heads were missing. Little Jessica Jenkins screamed and bolted downstairs towards the front door, with her two older brothers hot on her heels. They called their parents first and the emergency services second, and both of them arrived at the same time. The reeds were carried out an hour or two later, their destination the city morgue and, eventually, its crematorium. Sergeant Gary Mogford of the Homicide Division had theorised that it was a murder-suicide, though if pressed to ask what had happened to the girls, he could only have given a guess. They were still awaiting results on the strange grey ashes that had been found in the girls' beds, as well as the sharpened lumps of wood that had been lying beside them. As for Satan Claus, he'd flown on back to hell, his hellhounds baying in the wind, his thirst slaked for another year as his wife slumbered in her seat beside him. Oh, 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 he bellowed, his deathly voice echoing out like a thunderclap as he flew over the Chilterns. Merry solstice, and until next year.